I'm Rob LeCurie, Senior Editor here at Gold Derby, here with Oscar-nominated legend Harvey Keitel. Harvey, what do you love most about playing morally ambiguous men, tough guys and anti-heroes? Because there's quite a few of them in your career to date. Because maybe I'm one of them. <laughs> and I'm trying to always discover these qualities of my existence. And that's why I'm an actor. That's what interests me the most about being an actor. From when I began class in New York City till now and still does, it will to the end of my till the end of my days. Yeah, do you, I mean, do you appreciate that when people see you on screen, they immediately, like my heart rate will go up and I think, okay, whoever you're dealing with on the other side of that scene is not going to probably fare very well because you play very sharp, but, you know, morally ambiguous men. But what, I'd lo what, what I love most about what you do is um, I feel a connection with them because there seems to be always this sincerity and gravitas and charisma um, mm -hmm. with how you play them. Um, and so I'd love for you to talk us through why you think we gravitate to the characters you play, even if they're not necessarily good people. I think because uh, perhaps uh, uh, they're trying to be good and, and it's not easy. Um, uh, I grew up as a young, as a young boy. I grew up as a young boy. That's not like a ridiculous phrase. I was born and bred in Brooklyn, you know, and um, um, didn't go through high school, which I advise everyone to make sure they not only go through high school, but college as well. Um, joined the Marines at 17, um, got out at 20, uh, and uh, then I lost my education. And uh, I found it when uh, a guy I worked with asked if I wanted to go see about acting lessons. I said, yes, we both went to meet the Sackney teacher, Anthony Menino was his name, on 23rd Street, uh, just off 23rd Street, at 5th Avenue, way on the west side of the 5th Avenue, you're thinking about, so cross that out of your mind. Um, and uh, he left and I stayed. And um, I got to, I'm jumping quickly, and I got to meet uh, all these wonderful, wonderful actresses and actors I met along the way. Up until today, I'm sitting here in front of in front of you. Yeah. See, and this is all about you know the journey, and that's what you're able, I guess, to to portray. Um, let's talk about Lansky in particular, because of you know people who are morally ambiguous. I think um, Lansky would certainly fit the bill. Um, what drew you to playing Maya Lansky? We, we recognise him in pop culture. You know, he's been in lots of films, whether uh, you know as as Hyman Roth in the Godfather movies, or um, obviously in a lot of biopics made about him. Why were you compelled to tell this story? Because it's quite a definitive story, isn't it, about his life? Yes. Well, I, um, um, oh gosh, you know your question. Uh, I uh, you, could you come at me again? I know it's a long question, but somehow my my mind ran to Lee Strasberg. It ran to uh, uh, my uh, it ran to my own life. It ran to. Let me start here. My, that acting teacher I told you about, I went to see, gave me the first acting lesson that was the most, one of the most important lessons I've ever got in my life. I had never been to an acting class, you know, I was still living in Brooklyn. So there's a uh, clothing rack, uh, a coat rack with a lot of hangers on it. He says to me, this is after my friend left, he says, uh, go over there and count the hangers on that rack. Uh, okay, I went over there. There must have been about uh, 50 of them. I was sorry, where? I came back. He said, did you count them? I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He said, how many are there? I said, well, it must be about 30, 40. He said, well, go back and count every single one of them because acting is doing things truthfully with a purpose. And that is the guiding lesson I took with me till today and through today. Um, so in seeking the truthful number of hangers, 
um, it took a much more difficult journey than just going over to that coat rack. To find, yeah. out, to find out these qualities I was looking for in my life that I didn't possess. Yeah, see. I, 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 I began to read books and meet college graduates, you know, and I come from a place where, you know, weren't many. And so playing someone like him and playing him actually, to be more specific, um, I mean, you've been in films where you've played, you know, Mickey Cohen opposite uh, you know, Ben Kingsley, you played Maya Lansky in Bugsy. You, you now get to play him yourself. Um, it's, I felt like it was almost like the role that I've been waiting for you to play for such a long time. And it feels like it just really works to have, Harvey Keitel starring as Maya Lansky. We finally get to see that. Did you feel that way? That it was like, this is a role that it's something that you've kind of always wanted to tackle and now is the opportunity to do it? I feel you're being so kind and so um, um, uh, putting it so well that it makes me smile wildly. And um, uh, yeah, it makes me have to answer you honestly. Yes, I felt I should be the one Playing him, and then my parents were immigrants, you know, from Romania and Poland. And, uh, it's a whole backstory to that, and we were poor people from the under, from the underclass growing up in Brooklyn. Um, and Maya was a family man. You know, he had a son that was challenged and died in the hospital bed, was a cripple uh, his his entire life, and. Um, he was so smart and he had such an imagination. What if he had had an education? He, you know, he came to the Lower East Side the way my pa parents did, with no education, could not read or write or speak English. <clears throat> and uh, the way so many people did come to America, even now, the crisis we're facing. And look what they took out of President Biden's bill now. The... Uh, uh, the college, free community college for people. My God, I can scream. I want to scream. Uh, and it makes me think of an organization in America that I discovered when I heard that news that, my God, they allowed that to happen when we have one of, one of the richest and most powerful groups, a robotic group in America today that could send all those people to college. And that robotic group is the Republican Party. So um, you've got me all worked up here now. <laughs> <laughs> but it's so true. Like, it's like people will, will flock to this movie because, and it's, which has been out for a little while now, uh, because it's about Maya Lansky and obviously there's going to be a lot of violence and it's, it's a movie about gangsters. But I took away from it that it's also a movie about the American dream. Obviously, he comes from nothing, as you've described, just like your life and your parents. My parents came with nothing, couldn't speak English. But this movie is about the American dream and how if you if you really, really um, demonstrate the grit required to achieve the dream, you can do anything. You can become the boss of the, of the criminal organisation. What are your thoughts on how the movie is also a reflection on the American dream? Um, what was the end of it, what you said? What, what are your thoughts on how this movie is really a reflection on the American dream as well as being a gangster movie? Yeah, I, well, ga gangster is a genre. There are many kinds of uh, people that are called gangsters that are really not, and not only gangsters. Um, now your question, uh, again, I'm sorry. So it's it's a movie about the American dream, right? It's not just a movie about killing, you know, uh, people and and drug smuggling. It's more than that. This is really a movie about his struggle and how he moved up. Yes, yes, he had such a great imagination. Imagine if he had an education. Imagine the immigrants coming, dying on the way to get to America, as well as dying in America, if not physically, intellectually. Uh, um, uh, I wish people get it into their minds that these gangster quote unquote films they're seeing are people. How and why did they become such? There are many people yeah. in my own neighborhood that became such, by the way. Of, yeah. all, of all different 
religions and ethnic backgrounds. And um, when when he grew up in in a, in a pogrom and and the Russians used to invade them and he saw his uncle's hand chopped off, you know, by a Cossack. And then you wind up on America's shores and the streets aren't paved with gold, but with spit and snot and shit and, and no opportunity. Life gets to be tough. Yeah, it's very, that's very, which brings me to this. Um, there's a great quote in the movie where Lansky says, the only winners are those that control the game. Uh, by the end of the film, we realised that he couldn't really control the game, but he certainly had a really good go at playing the game, right, to his advantage, and maybe having a winning streak. Um, that is very much what the gangster genre is about, uh, and it's a very popular genre. Why do you think we flock to mobsters in films? We love to watch them. Well, that's a great question. Um, but you have to keep in mind that, that mostly people without an education, without the opportunity to get one. And, and also you have to think about the people who made these movies that you're calling quote unquote gangster movies. Some of the most brilliant men and women that we're ever gonna meet in our lives and they're trying to show the average citizen you have a lot in your life, a lot more than perhaps you are thinking of. But they were impoverished and uneducated. I think my answer to your question, to your great question, lies somewhere in the area of what, of what I'm trying to express. Yeah, and I think you not, I'm not saying they, they aren't criminals. They certainly are but they also are not only criminals. And there's a reason they became the criminals they became. I think we're on the same page because I think gangster movies like Lansky, to me, they're almost aspirational. Like That's it's great. the ultimate word. Yeah, because the powerless and we feel powerless and hard done by sometimes. Gangsters sometimes feel that way or came from nothing and have decided to control the game to make sure they get what they want. And that's aspirant. We all want that in some way. do you think? The, the, the way you use the word aspirational was perfect. And he had the mind huh, to uh, be that aspirational, uh, to live that aspiration, make that aspiration a reality. Now, had he had an education, he might have been able to control the um, the corporations, the large corporations that, that when asked about him being a gangster, he said, uh, we are not the underworld, we are the overworld. They consider the large corporations perhaps to be the gangsters. Yeah, it's so true. It's so true, it's, that's why it's so relevant to our day. Let's talk a little bit about your career, if we can, before I let you go. Yeah. There's so much to talk about. We could be here for five hours. I won't keep you that long. Um, <laughs> you know, Bugsy, Bugsy was the first uh, non-kid movie I saw at a cinema. That's dating myself. I was only 13. And I remember watching it clearly uh, to this day and how enthralled I was at that movie. You were nominated for an Oscar for playing Mickey Cohen. Mm -hmm. um, in 1992, it's been a while. Uh, what what were your what's your major memory from that night when you were nominated at the Academy Awards with your cast and your director? <laughs> well, first one was what the, what the was that myself and my brother, the two friends I invited, got there late. <laughs> uh, the second one was as soon as we got to our seat, which uh, most everybody was already seated. They announced that Jack Palance, I believe, was the winner. I leaned over to my brother. I said, there goes your house on Fire Island. Forget it. <laughs> what, what a shame. What a shame, you know. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, it was, you know, uh, uh, well, awards and all that stuff. Um, uh, when I, you know, it, 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 it reminds me of a story 
that happened in Cannes at the press conference. Uh, when it, uh, have you ever done the round tables in Cannes? Um, no, but I know what you're talking about very well. Yes, well, I, at the last table was seated like the Washington Post and the New York Times and, and Big Shots and they were all, all those tables. And um, one uh, person asks me, how does it feel to play a romantic lead in a movie for the first time in your life? And there was a silence for a little while. And I said, it wasn't the first time. And they all looked at each other, then back to me and said, well, when did you do that before? I said, in my acting class. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's true. I mean, it's come true. on. <laughs> it's true. You're, just, you're just trying to tell the truth. Yeah. Speaking of the piano, um, that, that happens to be my favorite performance of yours today. Uh, and I was, I was very, I'm, I'm still a little annoyed that your performance as George Baines, you didn't receive that Oscar nomination. Uh, when Jen Campion won her writing award, she spoke to you about how important you were to the film and uh, Holly Hunter. You won an Oscar equivalent in Australia for that role. Yes. What, what's your, mem your highlight memory from working on the piano? I met one of the most wonderful women I could ever meet in my life, Jane Campion. And you might add Holly Hunter to that as well, who performed her own piano work in the movie. Um, meeting Jane, I still get the chills. I'm getting the chills right now uh, when you talk about her. She is just something unique, special. I can't think of more adjectives to stay and a bit of a witch <laughs> <laughs> she would love that uh, <laughs> you know you've worked with some incredible directors over the over your career obviously you uh keep returning back to martin scorsese you work with ridley scott and quentin tarantino and brian de palma mm -hmm. um and some amazing I've roles worked well. with brian de palma oh you haven't no Okay, I might cut that out. I'll start again. I don't know why I said Brian De Palma. It doesn't matter. Let's start again quickly. Um, you know, you've worked with some amazing directors over the years in your career today, like Ridley Scott and Quentin Tarantino. and Obviously, Martin Scorsese, you've worked with on many occasions. And people want to talk about all kinds of films with you, like I brought up the piano. What do people generally want to talk to you about when they encounter you on the street or on set? What, what's the film they like to talk about with you? No, no one's ever asked me that question, but I, I will try to answer it for you now. One certainly is um, Quentin Tarantino's movie, um, Pulp Fiction. And the other one is um, The Bad Lieutenant. Yeah. And uh, Jane Campion's movie, The Piano. And of course, mean streets. <laughs> um, but but it's odd to me always that people still to this day mention the uh, the um, uh, uh, the bad lieutenant and uh, the wolf. Yeah, you know, I, I would say probably those are the two of the most mentioned, along with mean streets, maybe. And um, even though, even though it's so old, people people have seen. It. Yeah. Uh, uh, Quentin's movie and uh, The Bad Lieutenant. Yeah, as soon as I say Harvey, Harvey Keitel to someone, they, uh, someone said to me the other day, Bad Lieutenant, what an amazing film. People are still talking about it. Yeah. And I'll tell you what, if my kids were here now, they'd say Sister Act. So everyone has a different perspective. <laughs> <laughs> you better take them to the movies more often. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. Um, Harvey, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, congratulations on a great performance in Lansky. Uh, uh, finally, you get to play him, and I look forward to more from you. I, uh, I don't know if I said that uh, Eitan uh, Rocco Way wrote and directed the film. I have to say that because when I got the call that someone wants you to make um, uh, uh, play Lansky in a movie, and his name is Eitan Rockefeller, I just saw the cash register light up, <laughs> ching, 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 ching. And then I agreed to meet him. And instead of getting Rockefeller, I got Rockaway. 
but I'm happy that I did. Well, I know, right? Wow. It's a missed opportunity. Maybe next time. Thanks again. <laughs> I really appreciate it. Enjoy talking to you. Bye. Bye.